Welcome to our Lord's Day devotional. As we continue to look at the book of Proverbs, we'll look at the second part of chapter 1 today. Now, last week, we looked at the foundation of our pursuit of wisdom. We learned from the first few verses that, uh, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning and the ground of our pursuit of, of wisdom. This week, our verses show to us a father's appeal to his child. He's warning him against walking with foolish people, because ultimately the destination of those foolish people is their own ruin. And so as I was looking at this, thinking about how we could present the teaching of this section of the Proverbs, I thought I would uh, repack, repackage it into a helpful seven-step guide on how to be a total fool. Hopefully you've read the verses, and now we can dive right into our how-to guide. Okay, so this section is uh, beginning here with a plea from a father to a son to listen to his father's and his mother's instruction. Or you, you could say obey the warning that they have. Let's look at verse 8 first here. It says, Hear, my son, uh, your father's instruction, and forsake not your mother's teaching. Now, this opening verse here is showing to us uh, an important uh, warning that we need to obey. This uh, teaches us that uh, the father and the mother have something important to say, and the child uh, must be active in this teaching and this instruction uh, by his parents. This means that you that the son can uh, has to do more than just go through the motions. That won't be effective in gaining wisdom. So as we think about our our how-to guide on how to be a total fool, it's to do the opposite then. The first step to being a total fool is to ignore your parents, or to say it another way, to be unteachable. Now, for step two, let's look at verse nine. The instruction and teaching of mom and dad is now here presented as something that is valuable. It says, for they are a graceful garland, that is the teaching, a graceful garland for your head and pendants for your neck. What we see here is that the parent's teaching is metaphorically presented as a victor's crown or a pendant that you would put on your uh, neck. Now, both of these images are outward and obvious signs of things that are valuable. That is to say that uh, they're metaphors for the parent's teaching that is meant to be displayed. It's meant to be worn and displayed for everyone to see because it's valuable. And it's not valuable simply because of the content of what it is, but also for the people, the the wisdom of the people who are uh, giving it. This warning is to say that to not be teachable is to despise the valuable things that have been given to you, that have been offered to you, to be passed on to you. And so the second step, being a total fool is to despise valuable things. But our heads and our hearts are not empty. Once you've despised valuable things, the next step for you is to cling to worthless things. Let's look at verse 10 here. Now, the father switches gears and he addresses the negative uh, influences that bombard us in everyday life. He says, my son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. He's exhorting his son to not give in to the enticements or the urgings of sinners, whom we can understand here more generally than, uh, than the specific sense of sinning against God, but those who are in general living apart from covenant fellowship with God. And so, the problem here, the problem here with consenting to the enticements of sinners is that they have nothing that's of value to offer to you. Surely their plan may seem fun and exciting, 
and you may even get a thrill out of all of it, but nothing lasting will ever come from it. As the preacher in the book of Ecclesiastes says, that it'll just be a striving after wind, be a clinging to worthless things. So here's step three, to cling to worthless things. Now, as we continue on, we can look through our, uh, our steps and come to a crucial step right here, which is to pursue the easy life. We need to look at verses 11 through 13 to get a sense of, of where this is coming from. Look here at 11 through uh, 13. As we scan these verses, we see here that the easy life uh, really means to profit at someone else's expense. A profit is the goal here. We see that in verse 13, where it says, We shall find all precious goods. We shall fill our houses with plunder. The plan is to get rich quick. Really, I guess, to so that you can spend the money on whatever pleases you. But we see that this get-rich-quick scheme is going to come at someone else's expense. You see in verses 11 and 12 that the idea is to ambush the innocent, so that once they're out of the way, their precious goods are free for the taking. You see, there's no desire to do any hard work. There's only a pursuit of the easy life that takes advantage of someone who doesn't know that you're coming to steal from them. So what we see here is that once you've decided that you should cling to worthless things, the next step is to pursue the easy life. Now, following up on this uh, step to pursue the easy life, once you're, you've done that, now you have to make sure that you keep company with fools. Once you've pursued this, look at verse 14, you do uh, the next obvious thing. You throw in your lot among them so that they all have one purse, it says here. You see that the idea here uh, is that once you've pursued the easy life, you need to uh, throw into the common pot so that you can all share in the guilt and so that nobody will snitch. Now, this is an important step to being a total fool. You need to fellowship with other fools. Now, look with me at verses 15 through 18. Here, the father returns in, uh, back into the narrative and he tells his son not to fellowship with fools because they're actually not very smart. Now it sounds like a good idea at first to pursue the easy life as you listen to what uh, the fools, the sinners are saying, but the father tells his son that it's not so easy after all. Look at verse 17 here. It says, For in vain is a net spread in the sight of of any bird. You see, the father's saying here that it's foolish to try to catch a bird while the bird is watching you. It's just going to fly away if it sees you coming with a net. The point is that anyone who thinks that they can catch a bird this way is not actually very smart at all. Now let's look at verse 18 as well. The father says, But these men lie in wait for their own blood. They set an ambush for their own lives. Here the father links the sinners from verse 10 with this foolish attempt to catch a bird while the bird is watching. They think that they're smart. But anyone who observes them knows that they're not. All they're doing is setting themselves up for failure. The reason is because they think that they're the smartest person in the room. They think it, though they're not it. They ignore godly counsel. They despise valuable things because they think they know better. This is a crucial step in becoming a total fool. You need to think that you're the smartest in the room. Finally, we need to see how the father ends with summary conclusion in verse 19. Look there now. 
Here he generalizes the hypothetical situation described earlier, and he concludes that the pursuit of the easy life, this uh, being greedy for unjust gain, will ultimately kill you. You see here, the father is making a truth claim. It's not just a specific situation of wrongdoing that will bring about a bad consequence, but every path that deviates from the fear of the Lord will take away life. This is the truth that the son must accept. Now, it's important for us to see uh, that the final step to being a total fool is to live your own truth. You've got to reject the notion that there is a universal standard and an absolute standard bearer who is calling you to think and to feel and to do a certain way. You've got to live your own truth based on your own thoughts and your own feelings and your own actions. You've got to reject as outdated and tolerant the idea that there is a God in the first place who has shown you what it is to do good. As he says in Micah chapter 6, to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with him. You see, instead, to be a total fool, you've got to live your own truth. You've got to find your own justice. You've got to be your own God. You see, once you've taken this final step, then you'll be a total fool. And we need to take some time to uh, discuss some questions now that we've looked at our uh, seven easy steps to being a total fool. So let's look at our, our questions here. First of all, how do we discern what is valuable and what is worthless in life? How do we discern what is valuable and what is worthless in life? Second, why does pursuing the easy life seem so enticing? Why does pursuing the easy life seem so enticing? Finally, how does our faith in Jesus Christ keep us from being total fools? How does our faith in Jesus Christ keep us from being total fools? These are the questions that we should uh, consider and, and discuss uh, together as we uh, hear from the Proverbs, knowing that it is the fear of the Lord uh, that gives us wisdom, it is good and right for us then uh, to go to Him in prayer, humbly seeking Him uh, to give us wisdom and that we would not be total fools. So let's go to God in prayer now. And our great God, we do give you thanks that you have uh, given to us your wisdom. We pray that you would work uh, by the power of your spirit in our hearts, that we would be teachable, and that we would seek to live uh, your truth, not our own truth, that we would seek to glorify you as we love you and we love our neighbors. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.